Okay, so welcome. Um, you know, today me and Andrew, we will be talking about racial trauma and mental health implications on specifically on the AAPI communities. Uh, Elizabeth, if you don't mind, we can go to the next slide so we can show mm -hmm. some learning objectives. For today's learning objectives, we're looking at several points. First, recognizing the current mental health climate, considering the increase in violence against AAPI communities, review of proven long-term effects of racial trauma, reviewing how we can best address racial trauma with clients, and then a Q&A at the end. Cool. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I want to discuss first that while we are looking at, you know, Asian, uh, Asian American groups, uh, what we are looking at, like it's, uh, we are only looking at 7.2% of the population. So here's a graph to help you visualize, you know, how much of the population that we're working with. And uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so, you know, when we talked about Asian, Asian Americans, you know, usually people would think of, you know, people who look like me, like the East Asians, Chinese, Japanese, Korean Americans, but actually we are looking at a very, much more diverse group here. So, you know, only like 23.3% of um, the Asian American population, the Chinese Americans, and only 20, then there's Indian Americans, which are usually uh, overlooked in the Asian population. And there's Filipino Americans, Vietnamese Americans. So we're actually looking at a very, very diverse group here. Can we go to the next slide? So looking at racial trauma, I, I thought Vera and I thought we could start just sort of by defining um, and talking a little bit more about what is racial trauma. So racial trauma can be caused by one acute experience of racism or by an accumulation of more subtle forms of racism over time. Uh, it's also important to note this could be overt, covert forms of racism as well. Um, and racism and discrimination can harm both the psychological and the physical health, cause post-traumatic stress response, including increased fear, anxiety, avoidance, powerlessness, and hypervigilance. Um, and this harm can directly or indirectly permeate affect family members and communities in a negative way. Um, when I was doing this slide for you all, uh, the word hypervigilance really spoke to me because um, Personally, I, I've seen and felt that come up within my family. Um, you know, the heightened attacks on the AAPI community have been vicariously traumatic for some of my family members and, and myself. Uh, since there's been a rise of hypervigilance, my grandma, my cousin have told me not to bike anymore, um, you know, and, and take Ubers or take cabs. And if you know me, you know how much I, I hate Ubers and actually love to bike. Um, but I know that they're all just concerned for me. So it, it's certainly widespread and, and can have some deep reach. And some statistics here to present um, to sort of flesh out more of this increase in violence against AFPI communities. Uh, first, according to a 2021 study published by the Center for the Study of Hate, Extremism, anti-Asian hate crime increased by 339% compared to the year before. New York, San Francisco, LA, and other cities surpassed their record numbers in 2020. And 40% of US adults believe it has become more common for people to express racist views towards Asians since the pandemic began. Stop AAPI hate which is a coalition that tracks and responds to incidents of hate, violence, discrimination, shunning, and child bullying against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States found that the majority of incidents take place in spaces open to the public, top sites being public streets, businesses, um, also buses, public transportation, uh, and AIPI women report more harassment than AIPI men and AIPI non-binary people. So some of the effects and impacts of racial trauma. Um, 
the AIPI community has had to face the complex and harsh effects of racial trauma over the past two years. Um, now, uh, although the, the trauma, the violence, and the hate have been exacerbated in the past two years, this is also nothing new. Um, Asian hate uh, has, has been going on for as long as the 1800s. Um, you know, in 1869, after the Transcontinental Railroad was built, Chinese immigrants faced hate and racial violence after and during that experience. Um, you know, and then furthermore, it's been exacerbated also by public officials referring to COVID as the China virus. And so families and loved ones of Michelle Go, Christina Lee, Gui Ying Ma, and those murdered in the Atlanta shooting, to name a few, all have to bear the weight and sadness of their losses. Their stories of racial trauma and others are told in this video that we have for you today. Video is coming up in one second. Sorry, just trying to get it to full screen here. Mm -hmm. No worries. I think the, the volume of the video should be, yeah. <laughs> the audio isn't playing. Uh, Elizabeth, if you're using headphones, you might need to remove those too. Sorry about Apologies. That. Being the victim of what? <laughs> we begin tonight with that MTA bus driver who tried to stop an anti-Asian attack and then became the victim of what? The attack too brutal to show in its entirety. A 65-year-old Asian-American woman on her way to church. The family that operates a store in Uptown says they were the target of anti-Asian hate after a man tore through their convenience store. A man clutching a knife accused of stabbing two older Asian women who were simply waiting for the bus. Oakland Chinatown leader who's been vocal about attacks on Asian-Americans was attacked himself. Many people have been asking me about this attack um, from behind. Um, what does it mean? My loved one got hurt, get attacked. That kind of feeling is so hard and so scared. I'm going to interview you on the interview. I want the world to know that is not right for being hateful toward Asians by not the problem of this pandemic. Of course, I don't want to be remembered with this hate crime. I have to work some more my mental and um, emotional well-being is not there yet, you know, um, like, like, that's the next step. <laughs> I've been here for a long time. I'm an American citizen. Is it just because the color of my skin or the way I look that I don't belong? There is that um, anxiety of just being an Asian. And I feel it from her because every time I go anywhere, she tells me to get in an Uber, <laughs> no matter how far or close. And I'm you know, struggling also with kind of the secondhand fear of what had happened to her. We still see the physical wounds and emotionally, she's definitely getting better. But of course, she's still scared to go out. 
it's unsafe. We still have to go out there and face it. They they okay. prey on the elderly because they can they can defend themselves. You know the elders. We are ranking them the highest. So we want to respect them. We want to take care of them. They are the ones that pass our culture on to us. In my mind, our mom. She's 93 years old now. 97. 97. Oh my God. <laughs> well, I'll be. He he doesn't remember. <laughs> when they get older, we take care of them. This is the Asian way of protecting the elderly. Oh, you know, they are who we owe our current life paths to. And I don't want to have to worry about my parents, my aunts, my uncles, other, you know, couples are going home walking down the street. And it's important for, you know, the people that have been born into this to also make sure that they're elderly generation, the immigrant generation also knows that um, you, know, you have your right as an American. You know, we're always in the background. We don't really stand up for ourselves. And now that all these people are coming out to put their voice to, I think that's great. It's about time. <laughs> I think we want everybody to know that she's a survivor. I want the movement to start through her and through all the others that have been affected by all this. We are Chinese Americans, very proud to be. Um, we're not going to just sit back after getting attacked. And we all have to work together and understand this is a country of many immigrants. Every minority group contributed something. While we might seem very divided, we're all fighting the same thing here. We're Asian, brown, black, it doesn't matter. Racism is an issue for everyone. Wow, very, very powerful video. Thanks, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Hi. Washington Examiner launched Sorry a new initiative that. titled No worries. This new journalism platform. I think we, looking at the effects, impact of racial trauma, we thought that video was, was spot on um, because it really speaks to this complex, complex experience. I mean, you know, they highlight the the anxiety, the the sadness, the sorrow, um, you know, the hyper vigilance. Uh, I mean, even the example that I said earlier about um, trying to take the most safe travel routes uh, possible and not, you know, bring more attention to yourself than needed. Um, you know, I think some of these are the effects and, and impacts uh, and, and the sad realities. And also, I think there are uh, experiences of perseverance and and um, and solidarity, um, and some of these family values that also shine through as well. Um, you know that I think we we ought to see. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important that we hear from like the survivors, because you know racism, racial trauma is never like a single story. It's you know many many individual stories. We can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And so we compiled uh, just some, some resources here for you all to uh, see and explore um, how we can all be doing our part. Uh, you know, if it's through education, mental health, um, taking action, uh, there are, you know, some really amazing, powerful initiatives out there. Uh, one, Safe Walks NYC, uh, they started in January of last year in Brooklyn when the rise of violent attacks, especially on women, soared. Um, the founder got news of an attack that happened at night in a neighborhood where his sister lived and then started Safe Walks. Uh, and after filling out a Google survey, volunteers can meet you to work, um, to walk you to work, to walk you to and from your house. Uh, and they currently have 2,000 volunteers and is growing. 
Um, so that's a really cool organization right now that's trying to promote more community, more solidarity, um, and create safe spaces in here in New York City. Yeah. Um, oh, I want to talk about something that I personally used. I used like a cap service for originally for Asian women. Then uh, it's called Cafe Maddie Cap. Uh, if you look them up on Instagram, it's like they they offer free cap rides for uh, Asian women, Asian LGBTQIA groups, and Asian seniors. So you basically you just pay up front and you know you submit a Google form and they will you know pay you back. They have a funding for that. We can go to the next slide. Yeah. So you know why are we here? We are all clinicians. Uh, what we can do to better help in a therapy group with, you know, the AAPI population. So, uh, I th you know, me and Andrew, we think, you know, to start off, we want to clear a lot of the stereotypes that we see, you know, when we are like, when people start to work with Asian, Asian Americans. And then we, you know, what we are doing here is just trying to foster a better communication with, you know, uh, AAPI community with white therapists, therapists of color, uh, you know, we're just trying to foster a better connection by looking at some of the cultural differences. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, to keep in mind that, you know, because Asian, uh, Asian American AAPI community is such a diverse group that comes with all sorts of cultural and cultural backgrounds, you know, it's, uh, it's really hard to talk about like, all the groups at the same time. So, so there are limitations to what I'm talking about here because you know my own background is you know Chinese, Chinese culture and East Asian culture. So uh, but feel free to chime in if you have more ideas. So um, yeah, so we can start off by looking at some major things um, that comes up that it's in, you know, that has like sort of a conflict with, you know with the therapy world. So first is authority versus equality. So when we are working with that population, we will probably see like, you know, there's hierarchy in their family and society, and there's a lot of respect for the authority. So in, when it comes to the therapy room, they will tend to see like the therapist, the clinician as more of authority figure. And, you know, it's, it's usually like a doctor or a teacher figure in the room. So, um, they're very used to a different way of teaching and learning. You know, it's rather, you know, rather than having a more like friend, like, you know, interactive conversation, you probably prefer like the therapist to take a more of an active role in the room. So uh, also when they're talking about life, they tend to treat senior family members, senior community members uh, and coworkers as authority figures and having power. So it will, it will make them feel really guilty to disobey or challenge or overthrow their power position in the, um, you know, in life or in therapy room. Yeah, the second um, is collectivist thinking versus individual thinking. So we will see like they oftentimes place goals of family and community uh, as more important than their own individual goals. So when they're making decisions, they tend, tend to take into considerations of the family members and you know the community members, they will feel like a lot of guilt and shame if you know they're only thinking about themselves, and they're usually consider themselves as selfish if they only think about themselves. And they also feel would feel like a lot of responsibility for the feelings and emotions for like their family members and community members. And the third part is you know relational versus you know independency. So they're much more relational and they have a lot of emphasis on family relationships and friendships, which is very also very common in other kind of cultures. Um, there's less emphasis on independence, you know, much less emphasis on, you, oh, you need to be independent while you becoming an adult. And well, another interesting side of this is that, you know, uh, because there is a lot of relational ties in adulthood, they will be less guilty while they're taking financial support from family and community members. And the last common theme that came up is harmony versus openly expressing and active emotions and opinions. 
So if you already have challenge with some population on like helping them expressing negative emotions and opinions, you'll be probably familiar with this because they're, you know, this population tend to be quite conflict avoidant. And there's a lot of emphasis on self-reflection while it comes to conflict and to maintain the status quo. So, um, so in therapy rooms, when it comes to into uh, conflict, they will avoid conflict and disagreement. There will be less, you know, it also leads to less uh, open expressions of feelings and emotions when it comes to, you know, when they see a potential change happening. It, it's also pretty common when that in therapy room, they will avoid talking about family and they don't usually bring the family, like if they don't start off bringing the family up because they know it will be, there will be potential conflict between them and the therapist talking about family, asking for a change. So they, they don't just probably avoid it at, at all. Yeah. And I think also, <clears throat> I mean, just to, to really echo some of those points, the sensitivity to the distinct client is, is key um, and it's imperative. While working with AAPI communities, clinicians should educate and acquire a working base of information, knowledge um, about about the group and be open-hearted. Um, Asian American families, norms and beliefs can be ever adapting and fluid. Um, you know, and I also know today, you know, in academic universities um, and, and settings, I mean, you can take a diversity course, um, but that all that really is, is maybe a, a shiny layer, you know, on, on other things that need to be addressed or conflicts. Um, so it, it, it does beg for the importance to educating ourselves, um, you know, when working with this community for some of these major themes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another, I think you have a great point. And to add on to piggyback what you just said is that I think, you know, every one of um, the clients we meet, it like has their own individual stories and their experience mm -hmm. can be very, very different from what you've learned in textbooks and here. Like my experience, uh, you know, as a first generation, you know, arrived at the United States will definitely be very, very different from a third generation immigrant. So to keep that in mind, like, you know, sometimes they don't, they're not very exposed to what we are talking about here. It's just, uh, you know, you know, you may see some shadows of the themes here, but most of the times you can, you know, they're probably very much assimilated to the mainstream culture and they're very much you know they have a lot of emphasis on equality individual thinking so you know always listen to their own individual stories mm -hmm. we can go to the next slide yeah so you know coming off from the main things we have some you know highlights on the communication styles that we usually encounter when we're working with the population and here it's just to you know you know be inspired by the themes we're trying to you know you know understand why they're communicating in a different way so the first is avoidance of eye contact or when listening or speaking with authority you know while you're in the room you're the authority figure so you know they have a they will probably avoid eye contact with you because you want to show respect, you know, avoiding eye contact when talking with authority is the way that they show respect. And there's probably a mild delay in response because usually people wanted to spend more time to reflect for a more accurate answer. Instead of like usually in, in training, we kind of want to hear a more intuitive answer from the clients, but here it may be a different story. So there's a subtleness and indirectness in communicating because of uh, the conflict avoidance. And, you know, they'll probably use humor to redirect and to cope. Um, they're not as emotionally expressive and they probably may, there may be a lack of facial expression because sometimes, you know, part of the culture like believes that, you know, if you have a better hold of your emotions, your expression, that you're considered as more mature or you have more of a wisdom. So yeah. And silence, you know, usually we use silence a lot in therapy and, you know, it's a very powerful therapeutic technique. But, you know, when it comes to this population, they 
probably will see, you know, they will probably be silent and wait for you to speak first because this is the way that they're being applied and they're showing respect. They're waiting for you to speak first. And there's also gender differences in communication uh, when it comes to the AAPI population. Andrew, do you want to expand on that a little bit more? No, I think it was all said. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, after we talked about some of the things and communication styles, uh, we looked into some research to see what are some suggested therapeutic implications when working with this population. Um, we're not trying to teach you anything and we're just kind of throwing ideas out so we can inspire a better com a conversation around this. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so some findings in research. I looked into both uh, research written in English, looking at working with Asian, Asian American population, but I also go back to my uh, mother tongue. Uh, I looked at research done in Chinese and look at how they're trying to implement a very Western style of therapy and what are the challenges they're facing. So here are some findings. So first, you know, a lot of people believe, a lot of researchers actually, actually they believe cognitive behavioral therapy is a more suitable technique. It's easier to adapt, probably because it's more, so it's more rational and, you know, it's kind of, there's a lot of evidence supporting the efficacy of cognitive behavioral therapy. And there are some people who, some researchers looked at the, uh, the person-centered approach, which I believe a lot of us are using. You know, the core belief of person-centered approach is in line with freedom, equality, individuality, and, you know, it somehow deviates from, you know, the East Asian culture emphasis on authority and collectivism. So there's a natural tension while implementing this kind of technique with the population, but there are still ways that we can do it because I believe, you know, I use person-centered approach a lot. And so, you know, you probably wanted to, you know, some suggestions from the researchers that you probably want to maintain the authority and you you'll probably want to be open to offer appropriate guidance and inspiration. Um, I would say it's just like you want to accept the fact that you're the authority figure in the room and try to navigate from that point. Um, also, there are research suggesting that, you know, you want to be more direct when working with this client, uh, this client base, because, you know, people who have a very strong, you know, background tied to the Asian culture will be probably more familiar and comfortable to start with a more didactic learning style, because we talk about therapy as we are like talking about like people come to be educated, people take this as a school and people are learning from the experience. So, you know, it's very, you know, many people from the population is very familiar with the didactic learning instead of more of interactive learning. So they'll, they'll probably have an easier time starting with like, you know, simple tasks like giving homework, analyzing their problems, providing resources, talking about strategies, very, very solution focused. So we think it will probably be a very good starting point for the clients. And also uh, another thing is that you always wanted to clarify their cultural values, see you know, how much of it is like, you know, coming from their culture and you know, to understand. You know, and a, a big part is like for the therapist to not you know, enforcing their own culture on the client. So while you're, I think it's a great opportunity while working with the Asian population clients, um, you will see how much of the values are actually very deeply embedded in the Western ideologies. And so you can learn from their experience and also learn more about your own therapeutic style. And I think <clears throat> this is our, our last message to you all. And, and you know, I think what we are hoping you all take away most from this and um, what moved us all the most in doing this. Um, so to read the quote, it's, as the Asian American community weathers pandemic fuel racism, the data prove that other groups deal with their own forms of hate, stressing that in times like this, solidarity benefits us all. 
We must bring attention to the hate that impacts all communities. All of our diverse communities, including LGBTQ plus communities have experienced hate. And there is a profound but tragic solidarity of that. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Such, um, such an important topic and conversation. And, and thank you both also for bringing in your, yourselves and, 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 and being courageous in that way, because I, I know that does take, take courage. I want to open the conversation up to everybody. Um, I know there was a lot of information in there and it, it's a lot to digest. Did anybody have any initial thoughts, questions, reactions, comments? Anybody want to share any experiences either in, in, in their own work as well? I'm just looking through all my, my squares on here. You know, one thing that, that I, I'm curious to hear both of your thoughts on, and maybe this is more of a conversation and a dialogue than a simple sort of question answer. Uh, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is just generally speaking, how the parallel process between the supervisor supervisee relationship and then the, the clinical experience and how racial trauma and how racial dynamics in a supervisor supervisee relationship um, can impact obviously the person who's being supervised or the supervisor but also then go on to impact the the client experience um, especially when there's racial dynamics going on can you speak at all to sort of racial dynamics in the supervisor supervisee relationship and even racial trauma that can happen in that relationship as well? Um, Andrew, do you want to talk about it first because you have a more of a supervisor experience? <laughs> sure. Um, I I think as, as a supervisor, it, it's certainly the, the responsibility and the obligation to put that out there. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think in there, in the beginning work uh, between a supervisor and a supervisee, um, you know, seeing how, what are the racial cultural dynamics in that supervision? Um, and this is an ongoing experience. So we really need to set the tone in terms of vulnerability and transparency. Um, and because we know, you know, that that supervision is going to affect the client as well um, and considering that. So really, I think just prioritizing to have that open and honest conversation. Um, and also, again, I think coming back to in, in schools, uh, you know, universities, colleges, one diversity class doesn't make us experts, um, you know, and we continue to have these conversations that are uncomfortable and necessary to have if we are going to continue to grow as therapists, humans, and also for our clients as well. I will say that, you know, usually my experience coming from the supervisee point of view, and um, I would really appreciate supervisors be, uh, you know, be willing to listen to, you know, um, my own experience instead of you know projecting their own idea ideas of like oh what's going on with you know if they're not asian like what's going on with the asian community because you know every asian comes from a different perspective mm -hmm. thank you for that i and yeah i brought this up because i was actually pretty recently um in a training and you know it was it was pointed out that in this field most supervisors are white cisgender female um, and that does set up a dynamic um, in a supervisor supervisor relationship and 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 how to address racial difference and and how to talk about race in that relationship so that um, we don't have a, a parallel process that happens with clients 
um, that is not healthy for them. I see a question in the chat box. Andrew, do you see the question or Vera, do you want me to read it out loud or do you all wanna take it? It's a really good one. Yeah, yeah, I, I can read it aloud. Um, so we have, I really appreciate the information as a faculty teaching multicultural counseling. I'd love to approach the conversation between the Asian community and other minority communities, for example, the black immigrant communities. Do you all have any thoughts? Can I invite Rasha to talk a little bit more? Hi, uh, thank you so much for including me in the conversation. Thank you for your work. Thank you for the PowerPoint and the resources. It's really helpful. Um, oh, I just realized my camera is still off. Um, I'm a faculty person at ENIAC and I'm currently teaching uh, multicultural counseling this term and I'll teach it again uh, next term. And we just don't have a lot of resources uh, or even ways in which to broach topics around how to create uh, conversations between uh, marginalized groups. And I bring this up because I'm a, an immigrant myself. Uh, I identify as Black uh, immigrant from North Africa. And I don't, I don't know that there is a lot of conversation between my Asian colleagues um, and, and other minority groups. And I think, I think there's some history there between um, Asian, the di Asian diaspora uh, and other minority groups that perhaps weren't always super helpful. Um, but I think there's been some progress, especially here lately with communities coming together and wanting to collaborate and wanting to uh, move beyond some of the, um, the hard things that have happened uh, between minority groups. So I just, I just wanted to bring that into the room. I wanted to say it out loud. I wanted to... Um, just talk about from my heart the the need that I see for minority groups to um, kind of say say things to each other that perhaps we don't always say uh, in public spaces. And so I want to I want to be in in solidarity with AAPI community, um, and I just want to recognize how how important it is for us to 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 bring these topics into the into this room. So thank you for for allowing me to say that. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I think it's very very important that the you know minority groups connected with each other, also you know all population connected with each other. Like the goal of this thing is not to you know further segregate each one of the groups as the, its own individual, but to create a connection and the communication between us. And I think that's why it's all, always very, very important that we look at individual experience. We also look at the big picture, but we look at individual experience because we may not share the similar kind of stories, but we share the same kind of feeling. And that's what makes us connect. And I'll also add to that, is it, is it Rasha? I didn't, I don't wanna butcher it. Yes. Rasha, <laughs> I, you're, yeah, you're, your academic setting is, is lucky to have you, um, you know, it's, it's sort of with this mindset and this worldview. And my first thought is copy and paste what you just wrote here and email it to all of the, all of your, your colleagues, um, you know, that you want to see band together. I guess that's just kind of the way I work. And I think, you know, I got that from my, my grandma, my mom is, if you want something, <laughs> you go and you put it out there. Um, so that it's it's a great it's a great question, and I, I'm you know I would love to be a fly on the wall to to observe what thoughts you know can what conversation can come from that. Um, my guess is from, it's going to be powerful. Yeah. Well, I'll be happy to update you all, um, you and and your colleague, um, if you want to make your emails available because I will when we have faculty meeting again. It is it is my hope that. Um, that we are able to to collaborate one with another and stand in solidarity with each other um, because we're all right we all share this country together there's no there's no country just for 
black folks or Asian folks or whatever you want to put in the in the front of folks. It's we're all one one big community. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I have a kind of a thought or reaction. I don't know if it's a question yet. It's still in the in the brain. So we'll see how it comes out. But um, I am a member of the team of the of the dorm. So I work with Andrew and Amanda and, and Vera. I just wanted to say thank you for jogging some things in my brain today around kind of collectivist identities and, and individualistic identities. I come from a very individualistic culture where it's really normal for my family and my tradition to say like a young person should go off and launch and be independent and use all of these terms that we use a lot um, at the dorm in particular. And it's making me think um, about, you know, how can we, be more inclusive in how we think about and, and conceptualize young adulthood and what would be an appropriate quote unquote developmental young adulthood experience, not just from the individualistic white US experience, but um, from, you know, thinking not only about, of course, Asian cultures that we're talking about today, but also a lot of cultures around the world and, and here in the United States that that really approach the idea of family and connection and and society in a way that it's not about going off and staking your claim or something like that and more about staying part of the family but your role changes as you stay part of the family and um so i just wanted to say that and i think we have a homework assignment at the dorm to go off and do some more thinking about how we message around that because it could send some messaging that there's one way to do young adulthood. And even one step farther, Sarah, how we pathologize, like not doing it in, in, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very, very important message. A lot of the diagnosis we see, uh, the criteria are based off, you know, a very Western ideology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes we take, uh, it's very important because sometimes we take that hierarchy, that sense of order as a lack of boundary and controls. And that's a very easy pathologizing mechanism. Yeah. Any other thoughts, comments, reactions? Uh, if if anyone like I would like to hear you know I would want, like to have a conversation with all your experience working with you know the population and what works for you and what's confusing you you know I I'll I'll speak for for myself as somebody who got into the mental health field, um, I, I got into this field because I wanted to help people. <laughs> I wanted to help people to, who, who were in pain and, and who were suffering to, to feel better. And I think the fear for me um, is saying the wrong thing doing the wrong thing. And, and I, I, I hear this a lot um, in supervision and when I'm doing supervision or in clinical team meetings, people, everybody has the best of intentions and that there's a, there's a fear of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing when working um, with a population, in this case, say with a population, with somebody from the AAPI community um, and, and fearing doing or saying the wrong thing. And, and sometimes I find that um, the, the fear can be almost paralyzed, so paralyzing that people like what Andrew was talking about, Andrew saying, you know, name it in supervision, talk about it in supervision. Also in the clinical room, it needs to be named and, and talked about. And the fear becomes so great that I think people are afraid to even acknowledge. I'm, I'm white and I'm working with you who 
is Chinese, who, you know, who, whatever the identity is, but if it's somebody who's different, even just naming that in the beginning in the relationship. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's not so much of a, a question, I guess, but more of a, a statement and, and owning the, the fear of saying you're doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I think we all share that kind of feeling, mm -hmm. for sure. Especially when it comes to working with a different group. Mm -hmm. Somebody said in chat, the best way to start is by asking questions. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then actually listening to the answers. Mm -hmm. uh, Rasha said, I want to name this. It's a bit of fragility that needs to be addressed in a clinical way. 100%. 100%. And I think that's, you know, always what it, 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 it has to come back to is, you know, mm -hmm. as scary as it is to, to do the wrong thing or to say the wrong thing or to say something that that is racist, to mm -hmm. do something that is racist, it is a million times worse to mm -hmm. experience racism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's why we are here. We are trying to have a conversation. I'm trying to connect it to, to be connected to all of you who look very different from me. Uh, so I'm trying to present some materials so you can better understand, you know, where we are coming from. We want to be understand too. So that's, yeah, that's the whole point of this. Uh, Lorraine is Lorraine, mm -hmm. yeah. Hey there. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment. Just thank you so much for this. I mean, being in Hawaii, we have a large Asian uh, Pacific Island uh, population. And I just wanted to call some attention to research. I know we always think of rational and CBT uh, when we think of, of, I know that slide on the research related to uh, working with, with Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but there is a ton of research on expressive arts and sand play and other methods of, of reaching people that are trauma informed. Uh, it's just not as well known. So I just wanted to put that plug in there that if we if you're doing expressive arts or sand play that uh, we just completed a meta analysis an international one that included studies from China and South Korea and uh, Japan and and the US and so there's that research too. <laughs> Thanks, Lorraine. Yeah. I'm very um I'm very mindful of time. I know that we all don't get a lot of breaks in between our our sessions, but I I wanted to see if anybody had any anything they wanted to add before we we closed out for the hour. I just want to thank the speaker. I know I've been quiet, but I've been listening. Um, usually I'm doing the opposite, so I really appreciate um, everything you shared. I definitely learned a lot. Um, I'll be working in peer services. So I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm young, younger myself, uh, 29. So I'll probably be working with, um, younger people. So it's nice to know that, um, you know, with the traditions of the culture, but also knowing like there'll be echoes of that. And then I can kind of, um, figure out a way that I can connect with those people, um, and be informed on the culture. So I just want to say, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you for saying that. Thank you all. Thank you everybody for being present and being a part of this. Thank you so, so much to Vera and, and Andrew for leading us in this really important conversation. And we look forward to seeing everybody at our next round table, which is to be determined, but you all will get correspondence and information about that. And, and thank you all again so much for being a part of this. Thank you.